This is going to be verse by verse of 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to look at the subject of amazing things that God knows. And number one, he knows who has believed the gospel. Paul says in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So Paul is a gospel preacher who is unashamed of being a gospel preacher. And he says in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So notice in verse 1 that he mentions they have received it. You need to receive the gospel. Don't just believe that Jesus Christ existed in history and that he died on the cross sometime back in history. You need to actually place your faith in him and what he did on the cross to be your payment for sin. Not only believe that it happened, but realize you need to put your trust in that to be saved. Receive him. One amazing thing the Lord knows is who has believed the gospel, believed in their heart to salvation. So you see this gospel here in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, you need to preach the gospel, you need to receive the gospel, and you need to stand in the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 2, it says, By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. It looks like according to the context that someone has believed in vain. If Jesus Christ really didn't rise from the dead. If you go down and look at verse 14, it says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So belief in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have that belief, this means you're saved. But you also need to keep it in memory. Don't forget how Jesus Christ died, was buried, resurrected for you. This will help you live a crucified life. But this person who believes in vain may know the facts of the gospel, but they aren't putting their trust in it to save them. Or they may not believe in that resurrection. And if you don't believe, if there is no resurrection, then it's all vain. Because that shows that Jesus Christ was just another false God, another fake God that couldn't atone for the sins of anybody. So you can believe in vain that way. And like I said, you can believe in vain if you just know the facts. Because the devil knows the facts. The devils know the facts. They've seen it happen. In James 2.19 it says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Acts 19.15, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? So he said, Jesus I know. I mean, they were there. They seen Jesus die on the cross. They know the facts. The devils know all about Jesus Christ. They've seen what he looked like when he was here in the flesh. they seen him work as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. They know the facts, but believing the facts is in vain if you don't put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross to be your payment for sin. The devils can't get saved, but you can get saved. Verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So Paul also received the gospel. If it is good enough for him, it's good enough for you actually too good for a man we don't deserve it notice that you can't mention the gospel without mentioning this little three-letter word that people don't like that word sin he died on the cross for our sins so all these people saying well i don't have to mention sin okay then you can't mention the gospel because that's part of it he died on the cross for our sins and this is according to the scriptures and if the scriptures say it then that should settle it why can't you say something that the scriptures say are you more holy than god and the scriptures 
verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. So the resurrection proves that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Have you believed this gospel? The Lord knows if you have believed the gospel. He has a record of every single person who has believed the gospel, and every person who has believed the gospel makes up the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe it according to the scripture, then you have believed in vain. For example, a Jehovah's Witness teaches that Jesus did not bodily resurrect. That isn't believing according to the scriptures. And that person is believing in vain. They're believing in a God that can't save if they believe that, a, that Jesus Christ didn't resurrect. They don't even have the facts straight. But that's an amazing thing about the Lord. He knows who believe the gospel. He knows who has the right gospel. And another amazing thing about the Lord is that he knows who has had their eyes on him. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he was seen by many witnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5, it says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. So Cephas is Peter, the twelve is the disciples, which here would include Matthias and not Judas. And then in verse 6 in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. So the greater part, Paul says, during that time remained up until that present time, that 500 witnesses, the greater part of them were still alive. There were people walking around when Paul was around that seen Jesus Christ after his resurrection, but some were falling asleep or dead. So that is a lot of witnesses who seen the, the resurrected Savior. Imagine if 500 people saw you murder somebody. Do you think you would be considered not guilty? So you think Jesus Christ really didn't resurrect when you have 500 witnesses who said he did? But even more than that, you have a Bible that says he did that you believe was written by God. Now verse 7, after that he was seen of James than of all the apostles. So this is James, the Lord's brother, who Paul says he talked to in Galatians 1.19. And then Paul says himself in verse 8, And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So this verse proves that Paul was saved before he was baptized. He was born again when he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And if you turn to Acts chapter 9, and look at verses 3 through 6. It says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he, said, and, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The Lord was seen by Paul on the road to Damascus. Now, as for you, you weren't able to see Jesus Christ after the resurrection in his glorified body. You've not seen him like that yet. But the Lord knows who has had their eyes on him. You have your eyes on him in the sense you're looking forward to seeing him at the rapture. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Titus 2, 13, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So have you believed the gospel? If so, do you have your eyes on the resurrected Savior patiently, waiting for him to return. You can't see Jesus Christ like those 500 witnesses saw the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. But you can look to Jesus now, have your eyes on him now, and the Lord knows who has their eyes on him. He knows who is patiently waiting for him to appear in the, in the sky to meet you. The Lord also knows if you're humble or not. 
If you look at verse 9, it says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul persecuted the church of God and wasted it. In Acts 26, 11, Paul says, And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So Paul persecuted the church of God. The church is the body of Christ, which is made up of every born-again believer. So this proves that the body didn't start with Paul. He was persecuting the body before he got into it himself. And even says in Romans 16, 7, that there was people in Christ before he was. So your only way out of this is to just make up another body entirely. Because Paul says that there was people in the body before he was. So that's why I believe that the body of Christ did not start with Paul. And then in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 15, it says, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So it's only by God's grace that Paul got saved and became an apostle and started working for the Lord. So just remember, any time that you succeed or accomplish something for the Lord, that you should give the Lord credit and not be thinking that you're all that and you did that on your own. He knows if you're humble or not. And if you're humble, he will exalt you. If you're not, then he'll let you fall to make you humble. Give God the credit for what you do that's right. And give yourself the credit for what you do that's wrong. It's only by the grace of God that you do anything right. So he deserves all the credit for it. Now verse 11, Therefore whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So he's saying it doesn't matter who preached the gospel as long as it's preached and as long as you believe. He's not concerned with being the greatest. He isn't concerned with being the only preacher you listen to. He is humble, and God knows if you are humble, and he knows if you're not humble. It is amazing because many times we can't see the motive behind why someone is doing something. We can't see if they are being prideful. But God sees who's humble. He knows the thoughts of man. And next, he knows who has a false gospel. Some do not believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we talked about before. Some don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ, which would mean he wouldn't have resurrected because he would have had a sin nature. Some don't believe in the sinlessness of Christ. And like I said, he wouldn't have resurrected if he was a sinner because, you know, he wouldn't have been God. People who teach these things have a false gospel. If you're teaching that he wasn't virgin born, if you're teaching that there was no resurrection, if you're teaching that he wasn't sinless, if you're teaching that the blood had no part in your salvation, then that's a false gospel and you're a heretic. You're a false teacher. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then his saints will rise from the dead. You being resurrected later is as certain as the fact that Jesus was resurrected. Now verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So you can count on being resurrected because Jesus Christ got resurrected. Verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. If Jesus Christ isn't risen from the dead, then anything a Christian ever preached or taught about Jesus Christ was all nonsense and a complete waste of time, and Jesus Christ would have been the biggest liar in history. But he did rise from the dead, and the years and long hours spent by pastors and teachers would have been for nothing if Jesus Christ just stayed dead and didn't get up out of the grave. Your faith is vain if he didn't rise from the dead. And if there was no resurrection, then you believed in vain. Verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then you are the one that's a false teacher 
You are the one speaking lies. You are the heretic. You are the false teacher. But verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. If God doesn't raise the saints up, then Jesus Christ wasn't really raised from the dead. Verse 17, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you, ye are yet in your sins. Jesus Christ didn't resurrect, then you don't have your sins paid for. You're still dead in trespasses and sins, and you're on your way to hell because you don't have a perfect sacrifice for sin if Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead. Verse 18, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And the Christians who have already passed on are perished, never to be seen again. And you'll never see them again if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So if there is no resurrection, and this life is all we have, then we are still without hope and without God in the world. You would have to take on the Joel Osteen philosophy philosophy of things which says to have your best life now because you don't have an afterlife to look forward to if jesus christ didn't rise from the dead now verse 20 but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept revelation 1 5 says he is the first begotten from the dead lazarus got up from the dead before jesus christ did and some others did but they died again Jesus Christ is the first one to resurrect and stay alive. Verse 21, For since by one man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So by man came death, by Adam came death. And you die because he brought sin into the world. If you look at Romans 5.12, it says, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. If you stay in Adam, then you stay in your sins. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are put in Christ, and your spirit is made alive, and you'll have eternal life. Verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, Afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. So it's like sowing a garden. Christ is the first fruits. Jesus Christ resurrected, took most of the Old Testament saints with him to heaven at his resurrection. Then the saints at the rapture are resurrected. In 1 Corinthians 15 24, it says, Then cometh the end. Here is the gleanings, the tribulation saints, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So you have first fruits, harvest, and gleanings. You have Jesus Christ and the Old Testament saints resurrected out of the heart of the earth at the resurrection. Then you have the harvest. When Jesus Christ comes to get the body of Christ and takes us to heaven, and then you have the gleanings, the tribulation saints, when it says, then cometh the end. So it's like sowing a garden. But another amazing thing that the Lord knows is he knows the future. Since God knows the future, he reveals a little of it to his saints, and that is what he does here in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 25. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So he must reign. This shows you that the first resurrection, which is in three parts, happens before the millennial reign of Christ. And the first resurrection is Jesus Christ with some of the Old Testament saints. That is the first fruits now in if you look at matthew 27 52 through 53 it says and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared unto many so that's part of your first fruits that's when the old testament saints that shows you that they resurrected when jesus christ did 
Then you have the rapture of the church. That's going to happen in the future. Where it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then, like I said, you have the rapture of the tribulation saints, which Matthew 24, 31 is most likely describing when it says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So the first resurrection is in three parts. And two of them haven't happened yet. And the Lord can see that. And he's told you about it. In verse 26, it says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And the Lord can look forward and see that. Satan has the power of death. And when he is thrown into the lake of fire, there shall be no more death. In Revelation 21, 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 27 through 28, For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So, what's something else that God knows? He knows who's living for him. Verse 30 says, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? If there is no resurrection, then why do we live in jeopardy every hour? Why do we live separated lives and potentially suffer persecution or fight the flesh or endure temptation and all this stuff and put ourselves in jeopardy if it's all just a fairy tale? We know it's not a fairy tale, and God knows not only who believes the resurrection, but also lives like they believe in the resurrection. Paul says in verse 31, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. So in the sense of Paul's walk as a Christian, he has to die daily. In Romans 6, 11, it says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in the sense of Paul's position in Christ, he's already dead to sin. Romans 6, 2 says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? But when it comes to his daily walk, he must die daily. We must beat our flesh back down when it rises up. Colossians 3, 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 1 Corinthians 15, 32 if after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So he says, after the manner of men, he has fought with beasts at Ephesus. So the beasts are actually men. And Peter talks about men who are brute beasts. The ed educated men of this world teach men came from animals, so men end up acting like beasts. When an athlete does good at his sport, they say, Man, that guy is a beast. You see how people will take something that's bad and turn it into something good. They even say if they see something they like, or they used to say this, they say, man, that's bad. Like B-A-D-D. -D. They take things that are bad or words that are connected with something bad and connect that with something good. They call evil good and good evil. 1 Corinthians 15, 32, If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So if there is no resurrection, then just eat, drink, and be merry, because what's the point in all this stuff if the dead rise not? But the dead do rise. So remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. 
1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you hang around people in sin, then you'll end up committing the same sins. This also goes for communication through music and television. Nowadays, your kid has communication with sinners across the globe through social media and Xbox Live and everything else. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So many don't have the knowledge of God because Christians don't tell them about him. They don't live it in front of them. They don't live like they believe there is a resurrection. So Paul speaks this to their shame. And the Lord knows how you're living in front of sinners. He knows who's putting their life in jeopardy or their, test, or their, you know, their reputation in jeopardy. And the Lord knows all about you. Another amazing thing God knows is he knows more about you than you know about you. In verse 35 it says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? This is a, a question that an unbeliever would ask. Many times you hear someone ask, Well, what if someone was cremated and their loved ones scattered the ashes? Or what if someone's bones were, were scattered when they died? Or what if sharks ate them? But God knows where the body is he knows how to bring it back together and the body will be changed in verse 36 it says thou fool that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die meaning the body can't be quickened quickened if it doesn't die just like a seed has to die and be in the ground before it will bring forth a plant verse 37 and that which thou sawest thou sawest not that body that shall be but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. So when you die and are buried, you aren't sowing the body that shall be. You are sowing the body that shall be. In verse 38, it says, But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is one. So celestial bodies are the heavenly bodies like the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels. The terrestrial bodies are the earthly bodies. That's why E.T. is called extraterrestrial because he's not of this earth. Uh, verse 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So the same way God made all these unique stars, it seems our glorified bodies will have uniqueness to them even though we will all get a body like Jesus Christ. God made all these unique angels who were called stars. It seems that we'll be all unique in our glorified bodies but we'll still have a body like the Lord Jesus Christ. Another amazing thing that the Lord knows is he knows where every saint's body will be at the rapture. In verse 42 it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in incorruption. It is, raised, it's, it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Your body goes down to the ground if you die. It goes down to the ground to rot. But then at the rapture it will raise in incorruption. You'll have a body that can't decompose and God knows where every saint's body is who ever lived verse 43 it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness it is raised in power so your body is wicked flesh that dies without honor but then it's raised in glory you die with weak flesh but you're raised in power you'll be able to walk through solid objects like Jesus Christ did in his glorified body You'll be able to fall upon the sword and not be wounded. You'll be able to run like a mighty man, as it talks about in Joel 2. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So it's not just a spirit, but it's a spiritual body made up of flesh and bone, just like Jesus Christ. As it talks about in Luke 24, 39, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. 
Now verse 45, and so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last man the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul back in the book of Genesis. But later, Adam would bring death into the world. He's the first Adam. But Jesus Christ is the last Adam, the quickening spirit. He raised up from the dead and had the power to raise you up from the dead. He's got the power to do that, to quicken you, to make you alive. Now, verse 46, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So you see this pattern through the Bible. Usually the second child was the more spiritual one. You see Cain and Abel. Cain was bad. You see Esau and Jacob. You see Ishmael and Isaac. You see Adam, and then the last Adam, Jesus Christ. So usually the second one in the Bible is better. Even you, when you were born the first time, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Your second birth is better. Your first body is natural and wicked. Your second body is immortal and sinless. Now verse 47 through 49. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Right now you bear the image of the earthy. One of these days at the rapture, you're going to bear the image of the heavenly. The verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Your flesh and blood are bad. They can't inherit the kingdom of God unless they are changed. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It seems your glorified body will be flesh and bone, just like the Lord Jesus Christ had in his glorified body. Your body has to be changed, and it seems your blood will be left behind at the rapture. You got bad blood. Now, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is a mystery that was revealed to us by the Apostle Paul. He says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Meaning, we all won't be dead at the rapture. And notice he says we. So he was looking for the Lord to come in his lifetime. He says we as if he's also speaking of himself. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Every imperfection you have in this body is going to be perfected. Verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the changing of the bodies happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Notice it said trump. The trump is a sound made by a trumpet, not the trumpet itself. So this isn't referring to the seventh trumpet in Revelation. So the dead in Christ, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, will rise first and they will be raised incorruptible. Verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption. That's the dead saints at the rapture. And this mortal must put on immortality. That's the saints that are alive at the rapture. Now verse 54, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus Christ is life, and he brings victory over death. That's why 55 says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Without law, you wouldn't know what sin was. If there was no law or rules or regulations, there would be no sin. But the strength of sin is the law. Verse 57, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The victory is only through Jesus Christ, not ourselves. We are losers without Him. He carries the team. He's the star player. And thankfully, He never gets injured or we would lose every time. Thankfully, He doesn't take games off like Kawhi Leonard and Kyrie Irving did all season before the coronavirus. If this life was a basketball game, Jesus Christ would play all 82 games, even the preseason, even the summer league. And then, of course, he would always make the playoffs and the finals, probably play the Olympics too. He, you know, he's going to play every game. Jesus Christ carries the team. 
He's the head of the body, the church. Now, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you feel like quitting, remember this verse. Be steadfast, unmovable, abound in the work of the Lord, because it's not in vain. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything you do for Jesus Christ with the right motive, motive you will get a reward for it. You're not going unnoticed. But this is the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15.